Hello. I am back to talk to you about avoidance learning some more. Uh, in the pre preceding episode, we talked about discriminated avoidance, where an aversive stimulus is signaled by a conditioned fear stimulus. Um, and uh, that kind of procedure led to the formulation of the two-factor theory of avoidance, which then became the dominant theory or way of thinking about avoidance behavior that remains with us today, although since its formulation, uh, there have been various other components added uh, to uh, the way we think about avoidance learning. Well, so if there is a dominant theory uh, for a particular behavior, one way you can become really famous is to attack that theory <laughs> and uh, uh, create a procedure it, uh, that the theory doesn't seem to apply to. And that's where free operant avoidance learning comes in. So free operant of, in a in a discriminated avoidance procedure, there is a warning stimulus, and uh, the avoidance response is only effective if it occurs during the warning stimulus, and that then turns off the warning stim stimulus and prevents the shock on that trial. Okay, so uh, the response has to occur at certain times, and can only be re uh, can only have its consequence when it occurs during those discrete trial. Free operant means the response can occur at any time and have some benefit. And there is no warning stimulus. So the person who uh, invented the uh, free operant avoidance procedure was Murray Sidman. <clears throat> he did this as a young man. And uh, the, the procedure was published in, uh, in the journal Science. He became very fa famous and for a long time it was known as Sidman avoidance. Now, uh, subsequently, Sidman went on to study lots of other things, uh, and what we know him for more uh, recently is his study of stimulus equivalence, which I'll talk about when we talk about memory mechanisms. And uh, Sidman himself kind of became uncomfortable about studying aversive stimulation and avoidance. He wanted he he was personally the the the, the nicest individual you'd ever want. He was an absolute sweetheart. Everybody, I loved Sidman. Everybody loved Sidman. He was just a wonderful, wonderful man. And he gave up, he abandoned the study of Sidman avoidance, but other people have kept up this work. So what is free operant avoidance? Well, it's shown in the next slide. Uh, a free operant avoidance is basically made up of two intervals, the so-called SS interval and the RS interval. So the SS interval, and this is a purely a laboratory thing. Uh, there are no warning stimuli, no warning stimuli, okay? There's no tone that comes on before a shock. There are simply shocks that occur periodically under various circumstances. And if the subject does not respond, then having received the shock, the next shock occurs and shortly thereafter is set by the SS interval. So the SS interval may be 15 seconds or something. And as long as the subject doesn't uh, respond, it gets a shock every 15 seconds. And these shocks are very brief, and so they don't last long. Now, if the subject does make a response, that initiates a period of safety known as the RS interval. And so during the RS interval, there are no shocks that are presenting, <clears throat> presented. Uh, the ne next shock occurs at the end of the RS interval unless the subject restarts the RS interval. So every time the subject responds, he reinitiates the RS interval. <clears throat> so this sounds kind of crazy and why go through all this trouble and so forth and so on. And I hope I make it a bit relevant to you, for you. Uh, um, but uh, one of the things you'll notice here is that in order to uh, uh, work this correctly, uh, you have to be real sensitive about the passage of time. And that's uh, illustrated particularly in the next slide. So in the next slide, the period of safety is indicated by those gray bars. 
So you notice that each time the subject makes a response, he initiates one of those gray bars. So if he responds again before the end of the gray bar, he gets another gray bar. Uh, so uh, the, the most likely time for the next shock to occur is at the end of the gray bar. Uh, and uh, as you can see, telling time becomes a pretty important if you want to avoid all these shocks you have to be able to judge when you're getting close to the end of that rs interval so uh, this is a fairly uh, sophisticated uh, time discrimination kind of temporal tasks and um, before uh, they sent john glenn up into space uh, nasa was interested in whether uh, the uh, g forces involved in liftoff and the weightless environment of space would disrupt behavioral judgments. And this involves a lot of pretty sensitive behavioral judgments. And so they sent monkeys up into space before they sent human beings. And what do you suppose those monkeys were doing? They were responding on a free operant avoidance procedure like this. Now, this was work that was supervised by Joe Brady, who was the head of the behavioral laboratory at Walter Reed uh, <clears throat> Medical Center. And he, uh, anyway, they did a lot of Sidman Awardens kind of uh, work. So uh, what determines, we don't have a warning stimulus. And so we can't uh, turn off the warnings. We don't have a warning stimulus that's gonna elicit fear. We, uh, response doesn't turn off the warning stimulus to create fear reduction. So what happens to maintain the behavior? Well, uh, Skinnerians uh, uh, proposed the theory called shock frequency reduction theory, which is more or less a descriptive theory, which uh, actually doesn't work very well. <laughs> there are evidence against it. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, uh, the general proposition for the explanation of uh, free operant avoidance response is that notice that uh, each occurrence of the response creates a period of safety, okay? Now, can you predict that period of safety? Well, sure because you know that you've made the response. So responding involves feedback cues, response feedback stimuli. It has sensory components. You know, I, I, I know when I clap my hands, I can hear it, I can feel it. And so making a response has sensory components. Those sensory components become signals for the RS interval, which is a period of safety. So there, uh, there's signals for the absence of shock, and we know that signals for the absence of shock of that sort become conditioned inhibitors. We talked about condition inhibition when we talked about Pavlovian conditioning, and it turns out that exactly that kind of conditioned inhibition is involved in free operant avoidance learning. Uh, you can make this more explicit um, by, uh, you can, uh, every time the subject makes a response, you can turn on a brief tone. Uh, that tone will become a condition inhibitor. You could do tests for inhibition and it'll pass all the tests for inhibition. So uh, response, feedback cues from the avoidance behavior um, become conditioned inhibitors uh, through their association with the period of safety that is uh, in, uh, initiated by the RS interval. And it turns out you know, other forms of experiment, types of experiments have shown that conditioned inhibitors that are trained in a fear context are actually positive reinforcers. So the conditioned inhibition of fear is a source of positive reinforcement which then serves to maintain the behavior. So uh, it, uh, the uh, full explanation of uh, free operant avoidance is that temporal cues come become signals for the next shock. As time passes, you get 
you can predict the next shot. If you respond, you know you're safe. And cues associated with the response become conditioned inhibitors. And those cues act as positive reinforcers for the instrumental behavior. Now, <clears throat> just to sh show you that uh, free operant avoidance is not limited to rhesus monkeys flying in space. <laughs> <laughs> we're in the summertime here. I don't know when you're going to watch this videotape, uh, but uh, we're uh, in the middle of summer. And what happens in the middle of summer? People go to the beach and they go to the lake and they go swimming in the lake. And what happens to these people? <laughs> well, most of them have a good time, but occasionally some of them drown. Now, uh, so public beaches have uh, lifeguards they hire lifeguards and that's a, a good source of income a job summer job for teenagers now what kind of behavior can uh do lifeguards what kind of schedule of reinforcement are they on well a lifeguard <clears throat> has to check a certain portion of the pool right to make sure everybody's safe in that section of the pool having checked that section of the pool and they have to do that even if they don't hear anybody in distress one of the things about people drowning is that they swallow water and they can't and then that prevents them from yelling and uh, they they may just sink down and you can't see them trying to you know violently uh, move their arms and so forth and people around them don't, don't hear them they just kind of disappear uh so the lifeguard has no warning that there's someone in distress over there so he has to look over there and that response is necessary for <clears throat> the lifeguard to avoid a tragic uh, drowning and having looked over there then the lifeguard has to look somewhere else but then he has to come back and look again over here so the rs interval is the interval uh, over uh, during which if somebody did drown, you could still save them. So the RS interval is reasonably short. You don't have an RS interval of 20 minutes because if the lifeguard doesn't um, make the avoidance response by checking to see if everything's okay there in 20 minutes, the uh, person will, will have drowned. So a lifeguard is having to make responses to avoid bad outcomes and he is having to make those responses in the absence of warnings to him. So it's very much like a, a free operant uh, avoidance procedure. Uh, cooking, uh, uh, you know, cooking pudding is like that. You have to keep stirring it. You don't have to stir it continuously, but if you haven't stirred it for a while, you better stir it again so that it doesn't burn on the bottom. Another case of uh, a free offer and avoidance procedure. All right, so let's look at uh, our next, our last slide, which kind of provides a summary. Uh, last slide provides a summary of uh, what's all involved in avoidance, avoidance learning. Well, one of the things uh, I haven't talked about uh, yet is that uh, avoidance behavior, of course, occurs in a situation where you get aversive stimuli. And so during the early trials, when you're not successful in making an avoidance response, you're going to get the aversive stimulus. That's going to activate your defensive behavior system, and that's going to produce species-specific defense responses like fleeing and fighting and freezing. And so you get a lot of instinctive defensive behaviors in uh, avoidance learning situations, especially early on. Now, later on, as trials are allowed to progress, you're going to get classical conditioning of fear. That's going to develop to a warning stimulus. If there is one, if there is no warning stimulus, that condition fear is going to develop to temporal cues, the passage of time. The more time passes, the more likely you're going to get to the end of the RS interval. Uh, the avoidance response is reinforced by fear reduction. And... It is also reinforced uh, by a safety signal feedback cues or conditioned inhibitors, which provide positive reinforcement for avoidance behavior. So uh, avoidance behavior is really complicated, and it's really complicated because it has to solve the fundamental avoidance problem, which is 
how do you maintain behavior whose primary consequence is that nothing happens, <laughs> that the aversive stimulus doesn't happen? Well, it's not that nothing happens. There is fear reduction and there is uh, uh, feedback cues that signal that you're safe. And uh, so it's those mechanisms that maintain avoidance learning. So I hope your avoidance responses will be successful and that you won't have exposure to aversive nasty things uh, to the extent that you can avoid them. Best of luck. See you next time.